All right, everybody, welcome on back here to Simple Faith Baptist Church, where the Bible changes us. We do not change the Bible. Brother Carlos here. We're going to go ahead and continue here with our Friday night discipleship class. It sure is a blessing to see all of you who are able to tune in, either listening tonight on our Podbean or on our Facebook and or YouTube channel. My name is Brother Carlos. We are Simple Faith Baptist Church here in Oceanside, California. And we're just going to continue with our topical study for discipleship class. This is part number four on the topic of the book of life according to the Bible and also the Lamb's book of life. And we are uh, digging into that together as a church family. So we encourage you to uh, search the archives on our YouTube or Facebook to catch up if you are just tuning in for the first time. And if not, we hope that we can continue to build off where we left off from uh, our past couple of weeks. So a uh, quick announcement for those of you who have been with us. I have been announcing to you that we were uh, planning on going downtown to Imperial Beach to minister with Brother Angel and the brethren down there. However, I'm just here to inform you guys to let you know that unfortunately tomorrow has been canceled uh, due to the weather. Uh, Brother Angel said that uh, he'll, he would like to postpone it because of that. So um, I will let you guys know what the schedule will be like for the future. But as of now, I just want to let everybody know tomorrow is postponed. Brother Angel wants to postpone it uh, until further notice because of the weather. So tomorrow, guys, we're going to go ahead and, and take a break. Uh, and so we just want to let you guys know that uh, in advance. Okay. So thank you guys for coming on out tonight. Other than that, Let's go ahead and get right back into the study. And before we continue, this Sunday, special special message. I'd like for you guys to do your best to not only come on time, uh, but try to invite some people. And uh, we're going to be talking about the Bible teaching of wash, washing yourself and being clean uh, the way that God describes it. It's really good. It's a good study. I'm getting it ready. So um, I hope you guys will, will be blessed out of that future message that is coming. Amen. Uh, you guys can close the door, right? It's a little chilly, and um, and that's cool too, okay? All right. Uh, so with that said, let's go ahead and uh, continue here with the material that we covered. Uh, for those of you guys who have been with us, you guys should be a little bit more familiar now with what we've been discussing, which has been the study of the Book of the Living. Uh, we've been discussing the Book of the Living, and then we've been talking about the Book of Life, and then hinting little by little as we get there, to the Lamb's Book of Life. I've been showing you guys that in the Bible, there are multiple book references. You guys can see on our study blog material that we are discussing. You can access on your smartphone from your church website. Just look it up for yourself. It's in the video description link in the YouTube channel and also Facebook. Just click on it and then it'll redirect you if you want to look at it closer to your face. If not, we got it here on the projector. So from the Bible so far, we've been letting God define for us the Book of Life. We've been uh, discovering that God writes every human name that is born into the world existence in this general book of the living or the book of life. But whoever sins against him as an individual, he has the prerogative to remove their name out of that book of life. However, he can choose to preserve not only your name in the book of life, but also to add your name to another book called the Lamb's Book if you respond to him in faith. We've been seeing from the Bible how the names of the righteous are preserved in that book. And we've been letting the Bible define for us to uh, these past couple of weeks how sinners could be made righteous before God. And according to the Holy Spirit, writing through multiple uh, prophets, if you will, from the Old Testament, uh, that is by faith. So when sinners respond to their creator in faith, Concerning the revelation that God has given them throughout time, God will preserve their name in the book of the living, the book of life. So let's go ahead and catch up now from where we left off last Friday concerning us as Christians. What does it mean for our sins to be blotted? And then how do we have assurance that our name is added to his book, not only preserved in the book of life, but the number two, added to what we call the Lamb's Book of Life. So here we go. Let's pick up now in our study blog. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather once again in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the saints, God, who were willing to come tonight for discipleship class. I look forward to uh, studying with them, learning together with them. We pray, God, for those who were unable to make it tonight, God, that you would please uh, watch over them. Uh, please be with them. Help them to tune in online. And, Lord, we pray that this study would continue to be used for the furtherance of your gospel so that we will continue to have an effect within our own personal life and any knowledge that we gain, God, that we can use it for your glory to help other Christians trust Jesus and then 
trust the Bible. So we thank you in Jesus and we pray. Amen. Uh, turn your Bible now to Ephesians chapter 1, Colossians 2. We're just going to remind you of some basic re uh, verse references that we've been discussing. Col uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and then Colossians chapter number 2. So here we have it, <clears throat> and you have it on the screen, guys. Uh, we are going to remind you guys um, after the Lord Jesus Christ uh, died for our sins and rose again from the dead the third day, we are going to see how God deals with us now concerning how he blots our sins from his book. And then what happens to our name? How do we have assurance that we are saved? So in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13, the Bible says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So again, according to the Bible, not a tradition, not a church tradition or a church interpretation or methodology or your feelings or your past. According to God's word right now, Ephesians 1.13, after you personally respond to Jesus Christ by faith in him, the Bible says you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So therefore, you can never lose your salvation because it is a gift. And once God gives you the gift of eternal life, the gift of the Holy Spirit, you are eternally sealed and preserved. Colossians 2, that's the second reference. Colossians chapter 2, look at what it says in verse number 13 through 14. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, that talks about God the Father, making you alive having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, now look at here, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, how could God completely blot out every single sin and offense that you've committed? Because according to the Bible, all your sins which you've ever thought and committed were placed upon Jesus Christ one time, when he died on that cross. So notice how the Bible says there in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 13 and 14, having forgiven you all trespasses, all, because he took upon himself all my sin and your sin. And so the way that God the Father can legally, from his infinite memory bank of knowledge and wisdom, how can he have the ability to completely forgive and then forget? Remembering your sins no more because he placed them all on his son, Jesus Christ. So because of his work on the cross, the Bible says that your sins and my sins are blotted because according to the Bible, that written condemnation was against you. So as soon as you broke one of those laws of God that were in your conscience, you're not a Hebrew in the land of promise underneath the laws physically written on stone. But you have a law written in your heart, according to God. You knew deep down inside when you did something wrong that you know you shouldn't have done. As soon as you became aware of that, God is going to hold you accountable to that now. So whether it was a lie, disobedient to your parent, whether you had a thought of anger against your fellow man, lusting after the opposite sex, whatever that might have been, according to God, you transgress. You stepped over the line of righteousness. And when you did that, you became a transgressor. And according to God's laws, you became a sinner. And according to the law, what is the penalty for sin? It's death. So when the Bible says that you were dead in trespasses and sins in Ephesians chapter 2, that is because that is the condemnation of God's laws written against you. That's what it says there in Colossians chapter 2. Notice, contrary to us. So Consider that now, because they are no longer, amen, contrary to you. Why? Because you trusted Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that your sins were blotted out where? On his cross. So that's why biblical Christianity, it is salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You are sanctified by three things. Who remembers the three S's? Anybody remember the three S's? We are saved by the blood, we are saved by the faith of the Son of God, and we are sanctified through the offering up of the body of the Son of God, Hebrews. All right, now, so this is the exact same truth proclaimed by the Lord Jesus during his first advent. Let's look at John chapter 5, verse number 24. Who would like to read that tonight? John chapter 5, 
verse number 24. Remember, guys, Friday nights is very, very laid back and formal, guys. Uh, you guys can volunteer, raise your hand, ask questions, and I'm also going to call out John 5, 24. If I can get somebody to please go ahead and read that. John 5.24, anybody out there? Amen. So now look at there, Brother Giovanni. I want you to cross-reference now in parallel. Look at how Jesus defines death. And then look at how he defines life. According to Jesus Christ, if you if you parallel now John 5, 24 with Colossians chapter 2, the Bible says when you believe in Jesus Christ, you shall not come into what? Condemnation. So that's why, Brother Carlos, how do I define then when the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2 that before we were born again Christians, we were dead in sins and trespasses? Let me, let me go ahead and show you guys that real quick so you guys can see what I'm referring to. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, look now with, uh, with me here, verse number 1 through 3. The Bible says, and you hath he quickened. So again, that word quickened is just another uh, uh, term for you being made alive. You being, if you will, converted from dead, that condemnation, to alive in Christ. Look at verse 1. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So see, when Brother Giovanni read that in John 5.24, children of wrath, condemnation. Dead in trespass and sins, condemnation. But it doesn't mean that you were unable to respond to the gospel like the Reformed Calvinist friends teach, that you and I were just completely depraved in what they call deadness of the sinner, that unless God first touches you, then you can't even respond because you're completely dead. No. Jesus Christ invited humanity to come unto him, to believe on him. It was their choice to respond to him. So that's why I tell you, friend, when the Bible uses this terminology, it is describing what I am sharing with you tonight as the sentence of condemnation, which is death. In other words, I want you to think about this analogy. Right now, there are people in jail, and they are on what they call death row. And people that are in death row, what are they waiting for? They're waiting to be physically executed. That is their sentence of condemnation. So have you ever heard of the term? dead men walking that's exactly what they are but they're alive but they have a sentence that has condemned them to death because what they transgressed the laws of man to the point where it merited this is your judgment what we have decreed according to our laws is you deserve to die for the for the the criminal act you've committed so i want you to understand that when the Bible uses the term, you were dead in trespasses and sins, just let the scriptures help define that for you. When you parallel that in your King James Bible, death, dead, you're going to see condemnation. So notice there, children of wrath. Before you were born again, that's why you were a dead sinner. Because the laws of God, His holy laws, you transgressed. You've committed acts worthy of the sentence of death. And so if you died as an unbeliever, a non-Christian, you would receive the consequence of your condemnation, which is death, and that would send you to hell because you didn't receive the gift of life, which is in who? Jesus Christ. So when you respond to the gift of life, because you can, sinner, anybody, amen, you can receive the pardon the gift of eternal life. So let's go back now to our our, our, um, our display here. We're just combining the terms. We're letting the Bible define itself. John 5, 24, if anyone hears the word and believes on Jesus Christ and that God sent him to die for their sins, rose again the third day, 
according to Jesus Christ, that sinner will not come into condemnation, but notice, is passed from death unto life. So right now, any single person on this planet who responds to Jesus Christ in faith, believing who he said he was, Jesus said they will immediately pass from what? Death to life. So therefore, the sentence of condemnation written against Katie, Antonio, and Giovanni, and all of the list of sins that you've committed against God's laws, every single thing you've ever thought, every single deed you've ever done, every single one of those things, you know what that Bible said in Colossians 2? That was written against you. But Jesus nailed what? All of those condemnations and at his cross. So when you put your faith and trust in him, you know what God the Father did? He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you. And you should be thankful. Anybody here happy for that? Anybody here? Okay, I'm glad to be forgiven. Not just saved, but I'm glad to be forgiven. And I'm glad to know that all my sins are blotted out from the memory bank of God's infinite knowledge. Amen. The Bible teaches us as New Testament Christians that when we were still sinners, dead in sins and trespasses, separate from God because of our sin, we first had to hear the gospel presented. Then, either in that very moment or over time, when our spirit and our conscience responds to it, after we heard and then chose to believe, we then trusted. And after trusting the gospel by faith, we are saved by God's supernatural operation through faith, which we can read about in Colossians 1. You can turn your Bible there. Colossians 1. Let's read together verse 12 through 13. The Bible says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers. So before the foundation of the world, there was no pre-existent determination. It is made in time. You say, what does that mean, Brother Carlos? You were made meet after you respond to the gospel. God has to do a work in you in order for you to be made acceptable in the beloved, that's Ephesians chapter 1, to be a part of the body of Christ. So what is that What is that term called? Conversion. Convert. Converted. You were completely translated. You were literally uh, made an entirely new creature. That's why when the Bible term uses new man and old man, I know you may not feel it, and I know you may not comprehend it intellectually all right now with your rationale, but inside of Brother Giovanni's body and Antonio's body, Katie's body, and my body, there are two people living in that body. There is the completely new creature that God made right there, Colossians 1. But then there's the original nature that you inherited from Daddy Adam. And it doesn't matter what the shade of your melanin is. It doesn't matter if you're light shade, dark shade, poor or rich. We all inherited the sinful nature from Adam. That's why we all must be born again. So now let's keep reading. Colossians 1.12, giving thanks unto who? Anybody there with your Bible open? Giving thanks unto who? The Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Notice those next four words. Anybody? Who hath delivered us? From what? The power of darkness. Not only did the Father deliver you, brother and sister, from the power of darkness. Look at the next thing he did and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. How about that? So, after you heard the gospel, Ephesians 1.13, when Giovanni and Katie and Antonio chose to believe in someone telling them how to be saved, and the minute you said, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe in you. You can say all the rest of the words however you want. It's your faith. And as soon as Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father, heard you, the sinner, cry out to him for salvation. You know what he did? He saved you. And when he saved you, you know what God the Father did? He immediately delivered you from the power of darkness. What else does it say there? And translated you where? Into the kingdom of his dear son. So once you're in the kingdom of his dear son, there is no condemnation for the saints in light. Because you were delivered from what? The power of darkness. And now you were put into the kingdom of light. That's why we're telling you, friend, once you're in that kingdom, 
It is an everlasting kingdom, amen. It is an eternal kingdom, amen. You are never going to lose your salvation once you're in the king's court. Man, that's good. Somebody say amen. All right. Colossians 2.12. Colossians 2.12. Can I get a volunteer, anybody? Let's get active with our faith, amen. Let's get active. Colossians 2.12, anybody? Let's go ahead and start reading our Bibles. Oh, real quick side nugget lesson. So there you go, Brother Gibby, just to let you know in love. Notice how it says buried with him in baptism. So when you get baptized, all it is is a symbolic representation of you dying to your old man when you go under the water. And then when you come out of the water, it is a symbolic representation of you being a new man. So you died to sin in Christ, and then you rise again to that eternal life, that gift of life that Jesus Christ gave you. It's a, it's a representation of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. He died and he rose again. So when you go in that water, it's a representation of that. So I just want to let you know that. So now notice, notice what it says, guys. You and I, after we heard the gospel, we were buried with him in what? Baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the what? Faith of the operation of God. What does it say? Through faith. <laughs> How about that? So not only do you have the faith of the Son of God, Galatians 2.16, Galatians 2.20, but now we have this through the faith of the operation of God through faith. So God the Father converts us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, making us meet or suitable for entrance into the spiritual kingdom of His dear Son. During this regeneration process, the Holy Spirit places us into the body of Christ. Let's go ahead and go to Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Popcorn, Gibby, go ahead. You can even popcorn me too, Gibby, go ahead. All right, Romans 6, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? So again, when we are water baptized, it is a symbolic representation, not literal. It is just a uh, if you will, a, a commemoration of what took place on the cross. We are dying to sin in Christ, being buried, and then when we come up out of the water, we are rising up as that new man in Christ. All right, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Katie, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We're just going to quickly touch on this, on being baptized into Christ's body and why that's important. 12, 13. So it doesn't matter if you were born a Mexicano, an Africano. It doesn't matter if you were born into a, a poor family or a rich family. You and I were sinners under the condemnation of God's wrath because we broke the laws. But after you heard the gospel, the Holy Spirit of God, you know what he does? He baptizes you, that is your soul, into Jesus. And then the Father, Colossians 1, what does he do? He translates you into what kingdom? The kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. Man, that's good. Okay, I'll read this next verse for you, Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So now, during this process, now listen, either before or after some of these operations, Jesus Christ blots out from before the face of God the Father, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to, to, to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Can I get an amen? Glory to God. All right, thank you. <laughs> I believe it is the Lord Jesus himself who performs this very act. Hallelujah. The one who always stood as mediator between Almighty Jehovah for Israel and the, New, and the Old Testament and the world after the New Testament was established, the one who offered to blot out Israel's transgressions many, many years ago in the book of Isaiah. Remember we read that? Isaiah 43. 
It is the same one who offers it after his first advent, none other than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is true then, the statement the Jews of our Lord's day stated when they said, who can forgive sins but God only in Mark 2, 7? The doctrine of the Godhood or Trinity is not difficult for the sincere Bible believer because the Bible says in 1 John 5, 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So since Jesus is one with the Father, and therefore able to forgive the sins of men, but most importantly, blot them out from the memory of God, Jesus said in John 5, 22, the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment under the Son. So can you imagine what a wonderful heavenly scene that takes place every time a sinner comes to Jesus, pleading God's mercy for his Son's namesake? Although wrath stands between me, the guilty sinner, and God, the sinless Savior, you know what James 2.13 says? James 2.13 says, For he shall have judgment without mercy that should no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. So, friend, within the holiness and holy state that God dwells in, mercy seeks to rejoice against judgment. What a God. It is this communicable attribute of God that reminds the Godhead that pardon or forgiveness is available to us sinners. What an amazing God we serve. Can somebody read Romans 11.33? I'm going to popcorn Giovanni. Romans chapter 11, verse number 33. We're making good progress tonight. Romans 11.33. Man, he's a good God. I don't know how all this takes place. None of us do. But if we just believe the Bible, we're not called necessarily to understand and comprehend every single detail. We're called to believe. But every time someone gets saved or converted, all that operation takes place. The Holy Spirit takes your soul. He baptizes it into the body of Christ. God the Father, what does he do? He delivers you from the power of darkness. He translates you into the kingdom of his dear son. Jesus, what does he do with your, uh, with your um, transgressions? He blots them out, nailing it to what? His cross. Guys, all that takes place like that. All right? I don't know how he does it, but that's how awesome God is. So that's why I'm trying to say, what an amazing God we serve. I can't find it out, brother. Look at what it said in Romans 7, 33. It's, it's beyond my comprehension. Sometimes I don't feel like that. I'm not sure about you, friend, but I know you feel bad for certain things you do that you know you shouldn't do. And not only do you feel bad, sometimes you beat yourself up because you know and I know you're not doing as much as what you know you could do for this great God that saved your soul. But I just want to remind you, friend, God loves you so much. That's what he was willing to do for you when you trusted his son, Jesus Christ. You didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to earn it. All you had to do was what? Receive it. Isn't that a good God? So, before we get to our last verse on the study of this topic concerning the book, turn your Bible now to Revelation chapter 3. The last book in your Bible, Revelation chapter 3. That should be easy to find, uh, Gibby. Revelation chapter 3, the last book. Just turn it all the way to the right, Gibby. You'll be all right. Revelation chapter number 3. Let's go ahead and turn there now. All right, let's go ahead and start reading together. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse number 1. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. And hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Now listen, we're all important now. And I will not 
blocked out his name out of the book of life. But notice, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So now, this is a very debated portion of scripture amongst the body of believers. Uh, this is not necessarily a, a unique uh, methodology amongst independent Baptists, but generally, just general Christians, they all have difficulties when attempting to interpret this portion of Scripture because of the last verse there concerning what Jesus was referring to by saying, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess. Almost giving the idea that he could blot your name, okay? But that's why we're taking our time and carefully studying. Allow me to remind us of some context. Would you do me a favor and turn your Bible back to Revelation chapter 1? Look at what it says in verse 1. Can I popcorn Gibby? Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Mm -hmm. Signified it. There you go. So this last blessed book of our of our God to mankind starts with this, to show unto his servants. I want you to notice the recipients of this book are said to be his servants. Let's skip down to verse 4 through 6. Go ahead, Gibby, who are you going to popcorn? Giovanni. Okay, go ahead, brother. Four through six. Amen. So guys, according to Jesus Christ, who are the recipients of the letters to the churches? Was anybody reading with me in verse 1? His what? Servants. Okay. In verse 4 through 6, he is writing to how many churches? Seven. Jesus tells these churches grace, peace, from me to you. And according to the Holy Spirit through John, when he wrote that, notice what it says about Jesus. Unto him that what? Loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So guys, without entertaining commentaries and traditions of men who want to confuse this text of Scripture, why don't we just let the Scripture interpret itself by understanding who the audience is. He is writing to blood wash, blood bought saints. These recipients and these Christians in these churches, according to Jesus Christ, are loved by him because he washed them from their sins by his own blood. And not only that, but look at, he made them kings and priests unto God and his Father. Now, according to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29 through 30, the Bible says, I'll just read it for you, no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, the Bible says, Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So guys, the church is made up of born-again sinners, what did the Bible say earlier, brother, when we read it? Whether they're Jews or Gentiles who have been sanctified in Christ and then, from other Bible scriptures we read tonight, placed into his spiritual kingdom of God in heaven, eternally secure. 
Revelation chapter 1 says of these seven churches that he loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Therefore, moving forward, each church identified contains members in them that are genuinely saved and born again, from which position in Christ cannot be changed or removed, either by men or God himself, because according to the Bible in Titus 1 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So, verse 6 of Revelation 1 reassures the believer of their future service to their great Savior, their great head, their great king. All who convert and become born again throughout the church age will become a fellow priest and king with Christ to co rule, co reign with them at his second advent, Revelation 20. Hence, since these recipients are already fellow heirs, born again, these churches have eternal life. Remember, it was a gift. So now, let's go and break it down. Revelation chapter 3. Go ahead and turn your Bible there. Revelation chapter 3. When Jesus said, I know thy works, he's writing to an individual. Thy, T-H-Y, thy. So remember, guys, I gave you guys those, uh, those uh, companion dictionaries. If you open up the first page, there should be one near you there. You sh oh, no, let's go to the back, all the way to the back. Let's go all the way back here. Notice what Brother David Daniel said. I'm making it very easy for you guys. I am providing you guys enough and sufficient material to help you all, amen, because I love you all. I'm willing to invest. That's what a shepherd does, feed the flock, amen. Look at what it says. Uh, Brother David Daniel helps us to break it down. Why do we need thee and thou? In almost every language uh, but modern English, people know whether the speaker is addressing one person or many. In classical English, if the speaker is talking to one person, he uses thee or thou. If he is talking to many people, he says you or your. So the King James Bible preserves this. Remember when Jesus said to Nicodemus, Marvel not that I said unto thee, that's referring to the singular Nicodemus, ye, that's a reference to all people, must be born again. So remember now, thy, thine, thee, and thou in your King James Bible is a reference to singular or an individual you ye or your is a reference to then who plural more than one individual there you have it so now revelation 3 break it down what did he say i know thy works which denotes singular individual that thou singular hast a name that thou livest and are dead you know what jesus is doing friend he is rebuking some of the members of this truth for their hypocritical profession of dedicated Christian service. Mm, let me read that again. Jesus is rebuking some of the members of this truth for their hypocritical profession of dedicated Christian service. You know what that looks like? Somebody says, oh, man, you, you, you go to church, bro? Somebody says, oh, girl, you go to church? Yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. I, I, like, I go to church from a Bible. But you're living as a hypocrite. You know what Jesus said? I'm just reading the Bible tonight. Is that okay with you guys? Revelation chapter 3, you know what Jesus said? Look at what he said there, friend. Look at what he said there. He said, um, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and are dead. <laughs> Man, uh, talk about uh, just reproof and, and just getting it direct from the source himself. He says, I know that, that people know you by that name. I know that you tell people that you're alive by that name. But you know what I know? I know something that they don't see. I see what you really are like when no one's watching. I see that you're dead. Now, you, can I tell you something, friend? You know what character is? Character is the type or kind of person that you truly are when no one else is around. Character is who you really are when no one else is watching. So, friend, before you entertain the flesh tonight by th by thinking to yourself well no one sees me well they don't know well pastor carlos doesn't know so it must be all right can i can i remind you something jesus christ sees you jesus christ can call you out if you are not walking uprightly according to the truth so tonight what are we doing we are letting the bible teach us all right now revelation 3 1 through 2 before other men they appear right but before God, they are wrong. And verse 2, he stated that those believers still possess enough time permitted by him. Now listen, or something within their personal characteristics of life that he sees can still change before they die. 
because he said their works are not what? Perfect, which means what? They could be improved upon. Anybody here tonight? So look at Revelation 3, verse number 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Guys, imagine right now on planet Earth, outside of your little congregation tonight, there are Christians all around the earth who Jesus is still letting them live a little bit longer. Why? Because he wants them to get right before him. He wants them to repent from sinful living or carnal living because he hasn't found their works perfect before God. Now, I know that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I know that all our works are going to be tried through fire, and I know that some of the works might be burned. But could it be tonight, friend, could it be, now listen, could it be that Jesus is so merciful to you? He is letting you live just a little bit longer to give you another chance to get a little bit more done for him, to get your life a little bit more in order for him, so that way he can reward you. Man, that's good. Anybody out there? Could it be that Jesus Christ is letting Christians just live a little bit longer because he could at any time take them out? Amen. Remember Romans chapter 8? If you sin after the flesh and you walk after the flesh, you know what he said? You shall die. At any moment, God has the right to just take Brother Carlos to him because, man, that's the consequence. But could it be, could it be that Jesus is letting Christians live just a little bit longer because he said, son, I know you can get right with me. I want to reward you, daughter. I'm giving you time. Strengthen that little that, that little flame you got left, girl. That little flame, son, you got left. Strengthen that thing because it ain't perfect. It ain't complete. Isn't that good, anybody? That's free now. So now listen, let's go back to our notes now. Uh, Revelation 3.3. 3. Revelation 3.3. 3. Let, me, let me go back to the notes now. <clears throat> In verse 3, this is the answer to their problem, of which clearly... They were historically aware of, that is, that church knew exactly what Jesus obviously was calling them out on. They, they knew. Because he said their works are not perfect, they could be improved upon. From the first time they heard the gospel and believed, if they did not repent according to the Lord's direct command, you know what he promised them? He promised them a special, a special visitation to this church as a thief, which denotes a secret. Sudden surprise and perhaps removal of their church. Like a thief removes items from someone's house or building during a robbery. Hmm. Look at verse number four. You know what he is, identifies? He identifies a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. Which indicates that of the whole church, we don't know how many. Let's just say, let's just say that little church in Sardis, guys, let's just say they had 20 people. There's a few Christians in there that were that were walking right. So then what does that tell me? There's some carnal brethren up in there, amen? <laughs> Indicates that of the whole church, only a few were not walking out their faith carnally, but rather were being obedient spiritual Christians. Let me show you a couple of these references. 1 Corinthians 2.15. Look at what that Bible says. 1 Corinthians 2.15. The Bible says there, but he that is spiritual judgeth some things. Is that what your Bible says, brother and sister? It says all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. Mm. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 1. I'll show you on the screen. Brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying, strife, divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Guys, the Holy Spirit was reproving the church at Corinth for their carnal living. But what did I read for you earlier, believer? Just look up to the screen quickly. Look at chapter 1, verse number 2. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So according to the Holy Spirit, who are the members in this church? Sanctified saints. Are you with me now? Go down a little bit later. The Bible says in verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So what does that look like? You say you're a Christian. You say you're saved. So 
you go visit that church. Oh, hey, Brother Paul, I visited that the brothers in Corinth. Man, they're saved. They all have a profession of, of faith. And, and when they got saved in their, in their testimony, it's confirmed. Look at 7, that you, can, that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, guys, they are saved, they are sanctified, and they are gifted. Look at verse number 5. That in everything ye are enriched by him. That's talking about Jesus. In all utterance and in all knowledge. So, guys, these Christians at Corinth, what do they have? Sanctification. They are enriched by Jesus. They are enriched in all utterance and all knowledge by who? Jesus. Are you with me now? But chapter 3. Remember the few names like in Revelation 3 and Sardis? Chapter 3. Some of you are carnal. I, I can't even feed you with more food because you're still stuck on this little milk over here. You ought to have been eating by now, brother and sister. You ought to have been, remember what Hebrews chapter, uh, I think it is real quick. Let me just look up to the screen real quick. Look, look at Hebrews 5, Bible memory. Watch this. Go all the way down Hebrews 5. You can just look up to the screen. Watch this real quick. Bible says in verse 12 of Hebrews 5, for when, for the time, listen now, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a what? He's a babe. He's saved. He's a babe. Sanctified. He's a babe. Filled with the Holy Spirit of God. But, but a babe. Why? Carnality. Chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. Strong meat belonging to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So guys, that's why I'm provoking some of you guys in love. Over the time of your salvation, you ought to have been a teacher by now, brother and sister. You ought to have been involved a lot more now in your response to Jesus in your local church. And you ought to have been involved, but, but there's someone holding you back. And brother and sister, that someone sees you every morning in the mirror. It's you. It's me. It's I. Because for some reason, we prefer the milk. But guys, God wants to give us so much more. Now, what was their problem? Chapter 3, verse 3. Their problem was envies, strifes, and divisions. Now, I understand in chapter 5, he's going to call them out later for drunkenness, fornication, adultery. I, I know he's going to call them out for the other external, you know, physical hardcore sins and stuff like that. But these first three, it doesn't really seem like, in my logic, it doesn't really seem like that's, that's a cause for carnality. But guys, we're talking about a holy God. According to God, when he sees two Christians that are envious against each other, you know what he calls them? A babe. When he sees two Christians that have strife, you know what he calls them? A babe. When he sees two Christians that are sanctified, have all knowledge, have all utterance, with division in their relationship, division in their church, he calls them babes. So, guys, it doesn't matter if they're pastors. It doesn't matter if they're deacons. It doesn't matter if they're elders. It doesn't matter their church title. It doesn't matter their personal title. Wherever Christians are envying one another, wherever Christians have strifes against each other and then they're divisive against each other because of feelings, you know what Jesus calls you? A babe. He doesn't want you to stay as a baby for the rest of your life. <laughs> He's given you so much more power. Church, what did we read earlier in Colossians 2? Your sins are blotted. There was an operation of God that took place the day you got saved that the Father, Colossians chapter 1, He delivered you from what? The power of darkness. So Christian, you cannot blame Satan. You cannot blame your, uh, if you will, your spouse or your government or your family or your friends or your lack of money or blah, blah, blah. You can't blame nobody but you. God does not want you to stay as a babe, y'all. wants you guys to grow up. Y'all got to get off the Gerber, amen? He wants you guys to start chewing on some organic, non-pasteurized, brother? I don't know, what's that? He wants y'all to, to, to start drinking some more, if you will, 
uh, thick protein, amen. Some of y'all got to get off the, the five gram, amen. You got to get on that 30 gram of protein scoop, amen. Uh, uh, a little stronger, amen. He wants you guys to start growing up. But listen, until you're ready to stop the envies, the strifes, the divisions, you're going to stay a baby. So what are we talking about? Let's go back to the notes. What does this have to do with Revelation chapter 3? It has everything to do. It's all his word, amen. According to Jesus Christ, there was a few in Sardis that were solid, solid Christians, right? First Corinthians 3, I already showed you. He couldn't speak it to them as spiritual, but as unto carnal. Guys, that's why sometimes in churches, when there are weak Christians, they're not discerning spiritual matters and doctrine. They're not really understanding other things that we're, we're preaching and teaching from the Bible because they're stuck at that. Uh, that level they're literally hindering their growth because they're not getting the nutrients they needed at that stage and so that's all they can comprehend in other words remember how i just read you guys in ephesians 5 some of you guys have to have been teachers by now but you're stolen milk in other words the reason why you can't really get more from god is because you're not letting god feed you from the first thing he wanted to teach you which is forgiveness grace and mercy and commitment and integrity you know some basic stuff y'all man that's free tonight amen all right as pertaining to the garments defiled, maybe James 5 could add some further light. We'll get there in a minute. Because remember how he said that in Revelation 3, they weren't defiled, their, their garments? What defiles a man? Let's let the Bible define for us tonight. We're almost done. Look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 18. Matthew 15, verse 18. If you can read from the projector, I already got it up there, but let's read it together. Matthew 15, 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the where? The heart. Remember how we say, out of the abundance of the mouth, oh, I'm sorry, the heart, the mouth speak. Remember that? Jesus said, the things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. Brother and sister, before you yelled at somebody, before you complained about somebody, before you had a problem about somebody behind their back and you gossiped and tail bared, and you know what your Savior said? He looks into your heart and he says, that's where the defilement happened. Are you seeing now, guys? Revelation chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 3, Jesus Christ. There are some in Sardis whose garments weren't what? Defiled. Why? Because they were taking care of their what? Heart before who? Him. Mark 7.15. Jesus said, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. So, brother and sister, it doesn't matter if you're eating GMOs or not GMOs, organic or not organic. It doesn't matter if you like to drink a lot of coffee, soda. It doesn't matter what comes into you, y'all. That doesn't defile you. You know what Jesus said? The things which come out of him. Remember what he said in Matthew 15, 18. Where? Anybody? The heart. There you go. Thank you, brother. Look what he said. The things which come out of him. Those are they that defile the man. And then he says later on in Mark 7, 20, he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. Mm. I know we're talking about the book of life, but guys, this is, it's all a book, amen, of, of God, the, the, the life giver. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. I got to pull this up for you. Hebrews 12, 15, guys. In love, let me share with you in love. What is an example of that. There's plenty. There's plenty. But you know what? Here's what the Spirit has said. Look at here. Hebrews 12, 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of what? Bitterness. Springing up trouble who? You. Not the other person. You. And thereby many be what? Defiled. <laughs> So Jesus said in Mark 7, Matthew uh, 15, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, thefts, murders, you know, all that other stuff. The Holy Spirit in Hebrews 12, 15, you know what he said? Bitterness can begin to root up in your heart. And you know what it could do? It could trouble you. And as a result, Jesus looks to your heart and says, daughter, son, you're defiled. Because you didn't take care of your heart. Man, that's good. Anybody here? Amen. Anybody here? Woo! Man, it's getting hot in here. Amen. It ain't just the heater. Amen. That Bible's so sharp, man. Now, 
what does it have to do with the book? I'm t- it has everything to do with the book. There are a few strong spiritual believers in Sardis, Revelation 3. According to the scriptures, I, I just gave it all to you guys, it is safe to describe them now. Those spiritual believers were maintaining proper order of their Christian conduct and obedience to their Savior. Even, now listen, listen now, this, I need you guys to hear me out in love. Even while they were assembling themselves with their fellow carnal church members. Oh, that's good, brother. Amen. Amen, pastor. That's right. Look at it. Look at Revelation chapter 3 one more time. Look, look one more time. Look at what he said. Look at what he said. Uh, remember, remember, verse 3. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. Remember the individual. And hold fast and repent. He just wants them to get, get right. If your heart here tonight, I'm just giving you an application. If you got some of that stuff that's defiling you, then turn from that. Amen. It's, it's easy. Go to him. He can deliver you. Now, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee. Notice the individual, the individual as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now, listen, look at what he says. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have what? Not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now, I'm not here to teach you this. I'm not, I'm not here to be dogmatic. I'm not telling you that, uh, you know, that this is, uh, you know, something deep, if you will. But let me just give you a little, a little taste of, uh, of a thought. That's all, just a thought. Could it be that after you're judged at the judgment seat of Christ and you are found worthy in these areas, that you're going to have a special recognition? That's all I'm saying. Just think about it. It could be that if you keep your garments clean by not allowing yourself to be defiled before him as best as you can, because we know we're not perfect. But if, if you respond to him personally every single day the best you can, could it be that he'll reward you that day? Notice what I said in the notes. Let me read this, because this is real important. We, we need to close on this note. Let, let me repeat this. There were a few strong spiritual believers maintaining proper order of Christian conduct and obedience to their Savior, even while assembling with their fellow carnal church members. Because it is between you and Jesus Christ, no one else. Brother, I'm telling you, you can have so much more joy. Sister, I'm telling you, you can have so much more joy when you're doing it for Jesus Christ loving him and and showing him your loyalty and your honor for everything he did for you. And if you find yourself in a circumstance or in a situation surrounded by some defilement, what do you do? You keep yourself clean because he's going to reward you. He's going to bless you. Anybody here tonight? Verse 5, what does he promise in Revelation chapter number 3 to the overcomer? Let's read that together. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. To the overcomer, Christ promises a special recognition before God and his angels. Where do you think at some point in life you're going to have recognition for your labor in the Lord? The judgment seat of Christ. At the judgment seat of Christ or at some future time frame, when these believers see him face to face, Christ here promises not to blot out his name. That's what he said. He promised not to blot it out of the book of life. That's what he said. Jesus did not say that the believers' names are preserved conditionally in the book of life. He simply stated that he will not blot out their names out of the book of life. This seems to indicate to me that he will not blot out their names from the book of life since their sins were already blotted out when? on his cross, Colossians 2. So, the book of life is in whose possession? Christ's possession. And their names are written in it. When they, at the first, responded by faith to the gospel, the true individual believer in this church will not have to concern themselves with losing their salvation, which is a clear admonition to others within their congregation, who perhaps assembled but were not genuinely born again. Because like many today who simply go to church, 
Sometimes it is possible people come without even being saved, but they just come. Look at 2 Corinthians 13, 5. We're almost done. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5. Look what the Bible says. Examine who? Yourself. Whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? <laughs> so guys, you just got to check your own self. Am I really saved? Am I born again? All right, I am, God. I know I'm saved. I've, I've trusted Jesus. Uh, but guys, if any of us has any defilement going on, remember what God already did for you. He already delivered you from the power of darkness. He already translated you into the kingdom of his dear son. He already gave you the Holy Spirit. He already gave you the Holy Bible. He gave you everything you need to be equipped to live a victorious, clean life. What do you have to do, brother and sister? You got to keep cleaning yourself. What do you do when your dishes get dirty, brother and sister? You wash them in the sink. That's what you got to do. Every time you get dirty, wash yourself again. So tonight, if anybody has any defilements, I want to encourage you with some good news. You were already forgiven. Everything you've ever done against God was blotted out one time. Where? On his cross. So you're saved. But while you're walking down here, Jesus still letting you live because daughter and son, he wants you to, to get a little bit more chance of reward. What do you do? Get the soap. Clean yourself up a little bit. Every time you get a little dirty, a little defilement, a little envy, a little strife, a little bitterness, a little sin here, a little sin there, you know what you do? You clean yourself up. And then once you're clean, you strive your best to keep walking clean again. You get a little dirty again, what do you do? Clean yourself up. Isn't that good? So guys, as we're coming to a close, let me let me leave you with these last scriptures. Philippians 4, 3. Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. The Holy Spirit says to Paul, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, Help those women which labored with me in the gospel. By the way, sister, you can be a great laborer for Jesus Christ. Sister, you can help your pastor and your pastor's wife to soul win. You can. You can. Women can do so much if they want to. There you go. With Clement also and with my with other my fellow laborers, you know what Paul said? Whose names are in the book of life. Hmm. How can he have assurance that Clement and those sisters, who we don't know who they are, but the Lord does, how can he have assurance that they are written in the book of life? Anybody? Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out from the out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. Revelation 20, 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Revelation 20, 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 22, 19. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city from the things which are written in this book. What are my last conclusions on this matter? Revelation 17 speaks of names not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, whereas the next book, the Lamb's Book of Life. If you want to make sure that your name is written and then preserved in the book of life, and then we'll, we're going to get to this next Friday now. See, we're building up now to the, to the Lamb's Book of Life. It's simple. All you have to do is respond to Jesus Christ. Brother Giovanni read it earlier, John 5, 24. If you hear the word and you believe in me, you will pass from what, brother? Death to life. From under the condemnation of God to the grace and forgiveness of God. Some of you are saved. You already trusted Christ. But can I leave you with this tonight, brother and sister? I, I promise you. I know I'm getting too excited now from the Bible. And it may be the pre-workout too, brother Giovanni. But like real quick, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'll just leave you with this for reals. 1 Corinthians 16. Go ahead and turn your Bible there real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. What did Jesus Christ tell us there in Revelation chapter 3? That there were how many names there in Sardis? There's a few. There's a few. They did not defile themselves, right? Okay. What did I say earlier as your pastor in love? 
you can still be faithful even though you have carnal church members. You can, you can. Right? Remember I said that? Let me give you just three men who did just that, okay? 1 Corinthians 16, 15. Let's say, let's just say real quick for the sake of discussion, let's just say the church at Corinth, let's just say they had 50 people. 50 people, let's just say that. 20, whatever. He says, I beseech you, verse 15, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. How many brothers? Three. Stephanus, Fortunatus, and who? Achaicus. Out of the whole church, three brothers who were being faithful. They were walking worthy. They were keeping their garments clean. Not sinless, not perfect, but they were addicting themselves to, this, to the Lord. They were doing their best in their heart to remain faithful, even though they were surrounded by carnal Christians. And you know what the Holy Spirit said? If you have Christians like that in your church house, God commanded you, brother and sister, to submit yourselves to those Christians. Why? Because they're helping and they're laboring. And the lack of all the other brethren, they met Paul's needs. So I just want to leave you with that last note. Revelation 3, Sardis, a few that weren't defiled. <clears throat> Great example of a few Christians, even though they were surrounded by carnal Christians, they were, they were keeping themselves clean because they did not cease to labor and help Brother Paul because they loved Jesus. So tonight, friend, I, I want to leave you with those encouragements because you can do it too. Don't lose heart because Jesus Christ is in you. He can strengthen you to be faithful, and he can keep you going. Amen? Okay. Anybody have any questions, comments about what we talked about tonight so far of the book of life? Revelation 3, the names, defilement. Anybody have any questions, comments about what we talked about tonight? Questions, comments? So you guys learn tonight a little bit more about that book of life then? Keeping yourself clean? Defilements? Okay, quick question then. Where does the defilement start? From the outside or from the inside? Anybody? From the inside. From where? The heart. The heart. How can you keep yourself clean? How can you keep yourself clean? Yeah, submitting. The Bible says right there, verse 16. But also, as I shared with you earlier, clean yourself up. As soon as you get dirty, do you know what the Bible is? Ephesians 5, it washes you. Just get in the Word of God. More of that Word of God in you. It'll help you with that problem of envy, strife, the thoughts from your heart. It'll do that. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for the coming of our brothers and sisters here this evening. Thank you so much, God. I know some of them are not feeling good. Lord, would you please have your hand upon them, Lord, to help them recover. Lord, thank you for tonight's study. It was very important, God. And I'm so thankful, God, that we're, we're, even though we're not necessarily a huge congregation, God, we, we're not renowned, Lord. God, we have a relationship with you. We are cracking up this holy Bible, God. This thing is so good, Lord. It taught us so much tonight, God. A lot of the people that are out there on a Friday night doing Something else where they're not here tonight, God, they weren't able to benefit from the knowledge from the Bible tonight, God. And and these have. They, they made their way here tonight, Lord. So tonight, God, I, I hope and pray that it encouraged your children here this evening to know, God, that, that they can keep cleaning themselves every time they get dirty. And that, God, they don't have to worry about their names not being uh, uh, erased because they're born again. All their sins are blotted. So, Lord, if they know now that they're never going to lose their salvation... If they know now that they have the hope of eternal security, God, would that motivate your daughter and son this evening to live for you faithfully every day the best they can, God, with your help? Father, we know we have weak brethren in our church and strong. Would you help us, the strong, to keep loving the weak, to forbear them, to show meekness? And God, would you please keep helping the weak to grow stronger, to get out of that weakness, to grow and 
so they can too become uh, strong for somebody down the line as well. So, Father, thank you for them that are here tonight. Help us to get back home safely, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I love you all. Pray you have a good rest of your night. For, uh, thank you for coming for tonight's fellowship, amen.